I'm one of the co-owners and workers here at Pilsen Community Books. Well, not here, I'm at my house, but at Pilsen Community Books, which is an independent bookstore and worker cooperative in the beloved Pilsen neighborhood of Chicago. And I am so excited to welcome you here tonight, virtually, to celebrate Mairead's case, Tiny, which we have been waiting for for many months, and I'm so glad it's finally here, out from our friends at Featherproof Books. We're lucky enough to have a whole amazing lineup of readers tonight here to celebrate, so I'll keep this intro short. But I did want to mention that the book is for sale on our website at pillscommunitybooks.com, and a ton of you pre-ordered on Eventbrite, which is great. So just make sure that you email us with your shipping address, and we'll get those right out this week. And then after we hear from all of our great readers, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop any questions you have anytime during the event in the chat, and I'll make sure they get to our readers at the appropriate time. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our honored first readers, Rose and Pearl. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, thank you, Mairead, for including us. This is Rose. And this is Pearl. Hi. Hi. And we are going to start off with a show and tell of our beloved pet mice. There are seven of them. Are you ready, Pearl? Yeah. OK. Why don't you tell them about where we got the mice? So at my school, at the after school called YMCA, um, there were these two mice that weren't getting taken care of right. And one of our workers at YMCA was kind of like giving them away. Um, so we took them and it turned out that they were a boy and girl. Everyone said there were two girls. So there used to be two and now there's seven. And what happened, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're the rescue mice. Uh, one of the counselors, her roommate wasn't taking good care of the mice and so uh, the roommate actually told her friend that the mice had died and then uh, took them to the YMCA and put them at the sign-out desk free to a good home. And I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Because we wanted a pet so bad, mm -hmm. but Mama didn't want mice. We had an emergency family meeting on the phone and decided to uh, give the mice a good home. And boy, they took to it right away because they had lived together for about two years with no um, mouse babies. And within a few weeks, uh, we had many more mice. Tell, we had to get rid of all the males though, we except had, for one. We had to get rid of the dad. We didn't, get a, we didn't have to get rid, rid of Hero. No, we, we, we kept one mouse. We kept the mouse that kept on being beaten up by everyone. The, the males were absolutely toxic and were vicious to each other, relentlessly vicious, and of course also uh, tormenting the mother, uh, which is why we have so many mouse babies. That's Goldie, right? That's yeah. Goldie. Yeah, she looks like we Goldie. We tried to name them all. But... We did name them all, didn't we? Yeah, Dusty, Moonlight, Daisy, Sun, Sunshine. Who is this one, guys? I don't know. Um, the mom and the other, some of the other. Wait, is this mo That's Daisy, the mom? Yeah, Daisy. Yeah, she's not pregnant. But then... The she's other, healthy. The other one that looks like the mom is Sunny. Yeah, the, the other one that looks like the mom is Sunny. I can't believe you found me. That's... Oh, then we have... That's Dusty. Yeah, that's Dusty. And that's Dusky. Dusky! Dusty. Dusty or Dusky? Dusty. Dusty. Do you, you guys okay. want to hold her? No way. I want to. Yeah. I'm too scared. Oh god, don't drop her. Any other stories you guys want to tell about the mice? What it's like being having a mouse family? What do they eat? Um, anything healthy? No meat. We don't feed them. We meat. we eat some. We eat um. Eat less seeds. Food. Seeds. The crust. They also um, like to put like bedding on their food. Yeah, to, like save it for later. Yeah, they and like to cool. forage, and when we eat pizza, what, the crust. They always get our pizza crusts. Yeah, if we don't eat them. Mice are very clean. They also no. love. They yes, are very they are. clean. They keep so clean. No. Yes, they are. Like, I would really go like after like after like two hours of them. I mean, like an hour of them being there to get like so stinky. Well, they do go to the bathroom a lot. Yeah, but 
They love seaweed. They love kale, especially spinach, apples. Ah, we've never fed them apples. I fed them apples. Oh, they don't eat fruit, though. They haven't. At Halloween time, uh, we did feed them candy. Butterfinger and they Butterfinger. Yeah, and they love it, but they can't. They love it, but it's. They can't. It they creates can't. quite a commotion. They can't eat candy. In, so the females never fight, and uh, they play around with each other. They play around, they cuddle, they're very sweet and loving, never a trouble, except when there's Butterfinger. They like hit each other on head. No, they do that with like also. Wait, like they want the whole piece. Should we show, show one more? Yeah. Okay. It's a little confusing to Wait. show all of them, but. but. Can we show Hero? We can show Hero. Yeah. Hold it, or do you want to yes. hold it? You don't want to hold it. Ah. Oh, dude. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just scared. I, and that's Hero. It looks like really white. Uh, I think that the mice but it's not really white. would, we've never fed them mushrooms, but given what we know about them, uh, they would eat them because they like natural, fresh, healthy things. I think, you know, the mice will eat whatever they can find. And they don't need to drink very much because they get water from the food that they eat. Papa, do they eat carrots? Uh, yes, they love carrots. Who knows size of carrots? I don't know. And mice will live uh, two to three years in captivity, but maybe one year in the wild. You see, oh. the male is much uh, bushier with longer hair than the others. And also, he's hero. Um, he's so cute. Shall we go on to the dance? Uh, yeah. yeah. What? Sure. Okay. Any, you want to say anything else about the mice? Uh, they're not one year old yet. The mice are not one year old yet. I don't even know how many months old they are. We, we got them. I mean, yeah. They've been in our home for nearly a year. Oh um. And now we would like to show you uh, a tiny ballet. Are you ready, Rose? Take your place and I'll get the music. Rose is a little scared. Will you guys send, uh, you wanna, not? we don't have to do it. No. Okay. No. Wanna skip it? Okay. I think, I think we're having a, a last minute change of plans. Would you like to do something else instead? You want to show your paintings? Okay, one second. Rose is going to show a couple paintings. I too had many changes of plans, so. That's super real. Also, um, you guys, my cat is named Hero. So it's like, they, they must be friends somehow, I feel like. Facts. Facts. Mm -hmm. Did Hero jump out of the cake? No. Where's Hero? I don't know what it is. I had more. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. No, no, no. I accidentally put the male in with the females. Sorry guys, in my excitement, I put the male with the females and uh, there was squeaking immediately. Oh my God. This might, be, <laughs> this might be a very special night for the family. I don't know. Okay. So Rose has been making I love you paintings and I love you drawing. This is not okay, it's a drawing. Tell us about it. It was for Papa and I made it a long time ago. I made a rainbow and then this Really sing. Those are the clouds, and then I write it, I love you. And then here is um, me and Pearl, and then I wrote someone here, I, I don't know who it is. And then, then I draw sun, and then um, a spider, and then I don't know what these are, but then little stamps that are shaped as sun. And then I don't know what this is, and then I have my necklace, 
it is Parma Brown, and then I wear it. Thank you so much. Lots of rainbows, lots of love. It says my name on the back. Ah. And then. That should be good. One more? You want to do one more? Two more. Okay. This Two one, more paintings. This one is. Oh, we can. That's what it is. It's okay. Mm. What's that name again? Don't know. Rapunzel? No, no, Rapunzel. Um, I got this. I have a doll of her, but I forgot what her name is. And then here, the golden chest, and then um, the money inside, and then these are the coins, and then some the green stuff with the money, and then I get the golden chest with money inside. Yeah, and the coins, and then the green stuff with the money. Be sure to talk. Why does it have tape on it? Well, that was really beautiful. Thank you guys both so much. Um, and that's our, our presentation. That's our little show and tell of lots of rainbows and love and um, happy mice to you, Maraid, and everyone else. Thank you so much for having us. That was so wonderful. There are so much love in the chat and so many questions about the mice and many people okay. want to know more about the paintings. So I don't know if you guys are sticking around later, but maybe we can address some of those at the end. Sure. Uh, but many we'll fans. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, up next, we have Stephanie Acosta. Uh, Stephanie Acosta is an interdisciplinary artist who places the materiality of the ephemeral at the center of her practice, questioning meaning-making and manufactured limitations. Engaging ensembles and facilitated processes, she creates fleeting performance works that examine sight, space, and perception in shared experiences. Acosta has presented her works with and for Museum of Art and Design, Museum of Contemporary Art of Chicago, Chocolate Factory Theater, Knockdown Center, The Current Sessions, Miami Performance International Festival, Anatomy Collective, End Time Symposium, the Chicago Park District, the Performance Philosophy Conference, High Concepts Labs, Read Write Library, No Media, and Radius. She recently collaborated with artist Miguel Gutierrez on multiple projects, including Sale. Oh, my French is terrible, so Stephanie, please correct me after this. Um, this concerns all of us. Commission for the Ballet de la Reine in Nancy, France. I'm so sorry, everyone who knows French. And this bridge called My Ass premiered in 2019 American Realness with a dynamic cast of Latinx performers currently touring. The March 2020 world premiere of the multi-platform performance work Good Day, God Damn at the Chocolate Factory Theater, LIC, New York, was postponed. Uh, Stephanie will continue expanding on research of the cosmic and surreal in crisis with a series of cinematic shorts and publications. Now, without further ado, Stephanie. Hi, can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing, which is just that I hide behind my hair a little bit because it makes me feel better. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, so excited to be here. I am um, a lot of things, but one of them is not a writer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I very much wanted to try and kind of unpack some of just a bit of what happened to me when I got to move through Tiny and um, and spend some time. I mean, I've gotten to spend so much beautiful time with Marie through the process, but there's something so whole about getting to live in a thing that has been made so meticulously. Um, and in true me form, I'm going to translate it into something sloppy and sudden. <laughs> so let's see. And um, sorry, I'm like kicking the thing that my computer's on. But yeah, I don't know. If I get to like 10 minutes, just someone go like, uh, but maybe not. Um, I also like stay nervous. So sorry, <laughs> we'll be looking down a lot. Some of this is new. Okay, enough caveats. So the first monologue I ever did in theater and forensics team was a sloppy collage made up of translations of Sophocles' Antigone. 
Uh, a commonly used monologue for young, headstrong, high school, thespian, wannabe, bad bitches. The piece was the sort of titular character verbally annihilating uh, the character of her father, the king. Unsurprisingly, it covered all the bases for a reasonably rage-filled punk emo teen. It had feelings of something political, standing up to the literal man, and parents, and righteousness. That was a big one for me. I spent my youth training for exactly this mess of a world. Our misogynist racist theater teacher was egregiously abusive, but a skilled man who had made a good job of hiding the marks of where he hurt you, both physically and emotionally, though I still have scars from both. It's interesting to me now to think that the first thing that man ever heard come out of my mouth would sound so much like what I'd have to say to him years later, much later. So Joan Jonas talks a lot about haunting and the ghosts in process, what is becoming extinct as we watch and what is already long gone and rippling. Rooftops can be safe spaces. They can be a top for a boiling pot. They can camouflage if you live inside a mountain. Sometimes when I'm overwhelmed by a moment or story or experience, I use systems to literally sort through it. I think I worry if I'll, if I don't, I'll like choke on the bigness or lose it all together in a large sinkhole of time. In a way, my work is always a hoax, <laughs> a false reality meant to have an effect or at least an affect on those who experience it. Those I happen to who happen to, who do you happen to, who is happening to you right now? It seems only right I start with a collage monster of a monologue spilled from imperfect translations in the hope it would be a more true one if fidelity to anyone was abandoned. Somewhere early, I realized too many translations was better than one because no one is one thing. No word, feeling, explanation, singularity is both an absurdity and an impossibility. Demanding a fixity, we've already rejected on the grounds of everything we know thus far. My favorite part of mixing paint is doing it poorly and then trying to transfer that momentary swirl on the surface that I'm painting so, however, unsuccessfully. But for some reason, it does not give me the same feeling if I do it right on the surface. Feels like cheating. Like, I guess what I like is sort of the unsuccessful journey. Like trying to talk to the dead Dead mother, uh, can you turn that on? Can you actually face it at me? Dead mother, dead brother, green nails, sisters, rooftops, windows, grief, dead bodies, theater, distant bombs, dreams. The war is the war now is old. Walked woods, wet grass, breath bright. If people are left, then time exists. 
Taste alone in the dark, it, cord, car door, dust, shoes, beds, dinner, hank, music, driving, meteorites, stars, masses, future. Instead of choosing two things, you lay down in the dirt a while. Movement map. I want to be a death scientist. Fire, change, death, arms, dance, death, brass, knuckles, safety. Cuts, towels, daily death. We have bodies. Tables, mermaids, women, vomit, kettle, why, not, war, meant, salt, bleach, smell, dizzy. Roof sad, believe, sky, none, afraid. Beautiful change, boat, hair, sea. Potato, cliffs, mold. Bare chest, baby. Poison, wealth, dinner, danger, dance, eggs. Place to, you need to last. Spirit, smell, hair, sleep, bodies are hard. Smell, marrow, popcorn, died, dead, floor, vent. His brain is all sky. Patient, reasons, bodies, blood, dark, dancing, bike, arms, achy jaw. Bodies are everywhere. Walking, morning, birds, no, isn't scary. Noon isn't scary, but it's loud. Grease, straw, hair, shirt, walker, fell in love. Seeds rule, altar. Woods, pink, crows, gifts, crime committed. I need this to stay. Waterfalls morning, bathroom door, dandelion pictures, fight, violent, happy comedy wedding. Listen to me, you can survive this period. Here we all are all the time. When will you learn to be in this world? I once met Ellen Sixu and in our conversations, I asked her what of grief, which she basically blew off as you don't want me to talk about that. I just wrote a book about it, but it's in French and you don't read French, so you won't get it. Still, she has said so much about it. I think that's plenty. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Um, and I hope you're sticking around, too. Um, there is some love in the chat as well. Next up, we have Stephen Dunn, a.k.a. Pothole, because he's deep in these streets, is the author of two novels, Potted Meat and Water and Power. He was born and raised in West Virginia and teaches at Regis University's Mile High MFA. All right, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for the reading and for the mice. That was nice. I was very happy to see, to see the paintings in mice. That yeah, makes me happy. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. So I've been thinking about nice things. Uh, so I'm just going to read like a few nice memories. Nothing really connected. I mean, they're all connected in the sense that they're nice and I like them. So I was gonna read some nice things here. Um, so my uncle who sat in his favorite chair underneath a buckhead he'd hunted would watch NASCAR and during the commercials he'd read Malcolm X autobiography. When he got excited by a quote, he'd read it aloud to whoever was in the room. He was equally as excited about something cool happening on NASCAR. And he also used to take me hiking in the woods to find sassafras root so we could make tea when we got back. 
and then we would drink tea while watching NASCAR and listening to Malcolm X quotes. <clears throat> and my mom, who was a cook in elementary schools, she'd speak to every single kid that came through the lunch line and not only speak, but sincerely ask how they were doing. Even though she wasn't supposed to, she'd save food for kids who didn't have a lot at home. And she'd stand outside by the buses when school was over and pass out food, even if it meant she might get fired. But she never was fired for doing that, which is good. <clears throat> um, when I was a little kid, I was obsessed with the singer Evelyn Champagne King, who sang, um, love come down down. Ooh, you make my love. I'm a terrible singer, but I will sing anyway. Um, but my mom had a friend named Evelyn, who I thought was the singer Evelyn. <laughs> so I always begged my mom to go over Evelyn's house. And whenever we did, Evelyn would put on Evelyn's records and do concerts for me. And I told my mom about this memory recently, and she said, said that Evelyn really could sing for real because she used to sing in churches. So I just always loved that I got concerts from Evelyn and Evelyn. Um, when I was a single parent for about two years, young black men helped me with my daughter. They babysat, gave me money, cooked food for her, picked her up from daycare and did art projects with her, took her to the zoo, all so that I could have some time to myself or go on dates. And some of them, even young, even canceled their own dates so I could go on a date sometimes. And I've never been able to pay them back for that. So they all had kids later on in life and we're apart, so I've never been able to return the babysitting favor. So one day, maybe, you know. <clears throat> when I was first in the Navy and went to Guam, I was kicking it with this black dude from LA he was excited to go eat pad thai and he kept talking about it all the way down the street i told him i'd never had it we were crossing the street and he stopped me in the middle of the street and started sea walking around me like pad thai you've never had pad thai i told him we didn't have pad thai in west virginia he said how have you lived your life he sea walked all the way to the restaurant and ordered two pad thais on the second bite i was like Pad Thai, it's good. This is, I can't believe it, never had this. And throughout the meal, all we did was look at each other periodically and say, Pad Thai, yeah, I, I get it now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I had a cold the first time I hiked Mount Fuji, so I was slower than the rest of my group. They'd gone up and came back down, which we all thought we would do. A quick trip, go up and come back down the same day. But I came down when it was getting dark, but the moon was bright so I could see until I got below the tree line in the dense forest. I was alone and scared until I bumped into an older Japanese man who was also lost, but was using his cell phone as a flashlight. I held on to his shirt while we tried to find our way out. His phone died and I started cussing him out and I'm pretty sure he was cussing me out, but we didn't understand each other. <clears throat> we linked arms and finally found our way out about an hour later. We hugged each other so tight and grinned so much. Then we ate ramen and smiled at each other the whole time. Um, all right. And Maraid, there's a person named Maraid Case uh, <laughs> who, Whenever I go somewhere, <clears throat> I was going to go to Seattle to do a reading, and Marie said, hey, my mom could pick you up and cook food for you. <laughs> and my daughter was supposed to go to college in Chicago, but she changed her mind. But Marie said, hey, if your daughter needs somebody while she's there, I can help you out with that. So <clears throat> this is what I've been doing. I've been cataloging all of these moments of joy and people who have made soft spots for me. And it's an abundance that keeps me afloat, knowing that I've been the recipient of such like abundant joy and softness. I want to keep cultivating these things and try to be like these people who have made intentional soft spots for me. And it's how I thrive. And I love it. So shout out to Maraid and her soft books also, which are also, yeah, they are like nice things when you read them for yourself. They feel good. 
So thank you. And that's all I have. Yeah. <laughs> that's lovely. Now I want some sassafras Woo! root tea. That was so good. That was that oh. felt like a cozy blanket. Thank you so in the best kind of way. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we have Mairead. Mairead Case is a lecturer, writer, and editor in Denver. She's the author of the novels Tiny and See You in the Morning, both from Featherproof, the poetry chapbook Tenderness from Meekling, and To the Teeth, and a, col a column at Entropy. Mairead publishes widely, most recently in Poetry, JSTOR Daily, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. She teaches at Naropa University, at Gals Denver, and inside the Denver Women's Jail. Mairead holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a PhD from the University of Denver, organizes and has been a legal observer with the NLG for over a decade. So excited you're here tonight, Mairead. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm so glad that you're all in my house right now. Um, and uh, this is the cat hero, same name as the mouse. So just so you all know, um, <laughs> it's it's so lovely to be able to read with people whose like voices are in this book, like everyone here, a conversation I've had with you at different parts, like an actual like mark on my body, like I, you're all in here. And so that um, made writing this like not lonely, even when it felt like it probably should be. So um, thank you all. Um, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Rose and Pearl and all the mice. Um, and thank you, Mandy. Um, thank you, Jason and Parker. Thank you, Sammy, for um, bringing this book home, and Erica. Um, I appreciate you all so much. Um, I'm going to start in the beginning. Um, I'm somebody who likes to like read along when people are doing things. So if for some reason you have the book, like it's in the beginning. Um, uh, Zach Dodson designed this gorgeous thing, and uh, this book is for Maggie Queenie. The uh, um, the quote in the beginning is from Donna Haraway, and it is, it matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what concepts we think to think other concepts with. Kind of like a painting you wear around your neck with your name on it, you know. Say it. Here we are. Now is the time. There are always multiple times and possibilities. The work is to stay with them. It is dark. Tiny sits on the roof with her hand in front of her face. She can't see her hand, which is also her mother's hand. Their nails are painted green. Green for money, for growth without pain, even though Tiny doesn't really mind being hurt. She knows it's temporary, like the cold right after jumping into a lake, and even when the pain is everywhere. But every color stands for something, whether people understand it the same way or not. And that is comforting. It connects. Tiny painted her nails herself. She runs her palms up and down her thighs to warm them and to brush away wet grass. It is windy, and though Tiny can't see that either, she can see the slick flickering over everything and hear the wind in the maples. This city is always raining or between rain, except for two weeks in August when everything is a clear, firm edged blue. Every few years, July is like that too, and then everyone talks about it, about how remarkable that is. And it is remarkable for everyone to feel the same sun on the same day. Everyone has the same warmth on their faces. On other days, the light in tiny city bathes everything in vinegar, like it's a print ready to be soaked and rewound. People who think talking about the weather is boring have never had to be out in it together. Tiny slides her right hand into her shirt so that she can feel the bones in her chest. She cups the tissue and slides her thumb across the place where the ribs branch from her sternum. If Tiny's breast was a clock, her thumb would mark 10 o'clock to midnight again and again. Sometimes her thumb cramps. This is one kind of thinking. Tiny thinks about the soldiers who cut off their breasts so they could shoot arrows more accurately. In this way, they would always be soldiers. It might be like being a parent. Both situations are also physical facts that affect a person's ability to feed and eat, to work and travel. They affect how we are in the world irreversibly. Where is the soft dent in your stomach? 
Why is that red line on your chest? Tiny thinks this way when she misses her mother, who died when Tiny was a toddler. In science, Tiny read that babies who are born with babies are born with 300 bones in their bodies. Only those bones don't start growing until the second trimester. So when Tiny's chest formed, she was closer to being her mother than not. Babies are parasites first. Tiny used to be a blob. She remembers freckles on her mother's arms, but Tiny isn't sure if she remembers them from photos or from actually being held. This city is too cold and gray for freckles. Tiny's mother lived in another place when she was little. Before Tiny was born, after it, and even now in death, Tiny's mother tells her daughter that she is a brilliant and strong person, resourceful and capable of absolutely everything life presents her. Tiny is a helper, not a fool, and that is a fact written in stars. Stars exist even when people can't see them. Sometimes planes are mistaken for stars, but stars exist. Stars exist. Tiny thought she couldn't open the door, but she did. Now she is thinking about nothing and her mother because Kelly is dead now too. That's it. That's the story. Tiny thinks it again and again in and out of her body and time on the wet, windy roof. Tiny knows her life is different now, again. For as long as she can remember, Tiny has felt pulled away from this house. It isn't a strong pull, but it is undeniable, like her third eye is also a metal and magnets hover in the air outside. This is not a question of fate or forces or even restlessness. It's a small headache and a question about belonging. Tiny's home does not exist yet, or else it exists multiply, and in either case, she must leave here to find it. This is a fact. It is not something to fix. When Tiny stands in front of something, she faces it. Tiny is the tree growing towards the light and holding the dark. She is the plant growing on that tree, sponging food and water from the surrounding air, and she is the parasite eating the tree itself. Something here will kill her too, but never, ever completely. Tiny looked, looks, will look at death for so long that she isn't afraid of it anymore. She stared at death so long it could have opened its eyes back suddenly in the dark. It could have made everything that wasn't tiny into darkness too, like a girl waking up inside a whale in the ocean. But it didn't. And so, at first in a rush lurch, and then normal, as always, Tiny lives. This is a responsibility. She takes it very seriously. When living feels impossible, Tiny looks at the pictures of sheep, orchids, bees, lemurs, jellyfish, coral reefs, seals, moss, and microbes she drew inside of her mother's lab notebook and watercolor pencil. Tiny presses her fingers into roofs, chair cushions, and the earth. She spreads out her fingers and pushes them flat like she's about to arc into a handstand, a rainbow. Tiny drinks water and imagines her lungs full of color. She breathes out, imagining that color filling the room. Because Tiny is responsible and holds memories, she exists and belongs. Because she is no longer afraid of that pain or contradiction, she will threaten people or else they will treat her like a child. To them, Tiny will be a paradox of green fingernails, botanical faith, and buoyant heart. She will remind herself not to always apologize or explain herself or rationalize. We do not need to apologize for existing. Tiny has never seen a coral reef in person, but she knows they exist. They are nests, apartments, museums, public housing, fields, individuals, and populations all at once. Their tones depend on sun, chemicals, creatures, and who's looking. They are in as many ways as music can fill a room and the bodies inside it. Izzy looks out her window, which faces the side of Tiny's house. On the ground in between is glowing green lawn and cracked cement dotted with periwinkles. There is no gate. When Tiny was little, she could stand on this path with her arms out like wings and not touch either place. Izzy can't really see Tiny, but she knows she's there because the roof looks like it has a hole. Everything is shiny from rain except the place where Tiny sits, mute in her black sweatshirt with the bandaged hands printed on it. Izzy remembers the summer Hank, Tiny's boyfriend, kept asking them to smoke with him. 
Yes, Tiny wanted to hold orange light in her mouth, a little fire in her hand. Quick treats make you easy to find. Izzy found pictures of lungs like burnt marshmallows. She showed them to Tiny, but that rhetoric didn't work. Tiny already knew smoking was bad. She also knew death was inevitable. It was already her ghost. Later that summer, Tiny read an article about how smoking companies market to people in weak or vulnerable moments, and that's when she asked Hank to cut it out. Tiny would be fine just smelling the smoke in his hair. Izzy was mostly fine with that decision, too. She knows her sister is not a fire to tend. Tiny and Izzy are not sisters by blood, but they are sisters by everything else. Their mothers show dress-up clothes, recipes, affordable travel tips, and escape plans. Their plans were usually elaborate, rarely unrealistic. Sometimes people think Tiny and Izzy are girlfriends. They let them think that. It's whatever. If people ask, however, Izzy and Tiny say intimacy isn't only for monogamous sexual relationships. They don't want to be posers. They promise to love each other always and differently when necessary, like Wave says. Three minutes later, a car sloshes down the street. The sound curves over wet leaves and red taillights spark like puddles. The rain makes city air shine like a wiped down mirror, and both sisters take that gleam into their lungs. Izzy is happy to know she and Tiny are home together. Waiting for Tiny to come back can be a constant anxious swallowing that Izzy is learning to stop. Tiny doesn't want to be tracked. There is no other option. They've both tried. Both sisters see the car. It's a dark color with six bumper stickers on the back. Izzy thinks one says Earth. This is comforting. A good night. They don't have to say anything else to each other. Tiny doesn't want to understand anything completely, ever, including herself. She would rather wonder a little bit, or wonder. This is like wishing to live forever. People want to understand, and because of that, some of them have a hard time not killing everything. Sometimes it's by accident, or for preservation. But to completely understand something, it must never change. There must be a null set, and so people explode mountains. They slice open chests. They name land separately from what it does or did or is, and especially when it never needed to be different in the first place. But how do you look at a body and say, when she was little, she wanted to be a fire truck? How do you say love horrified them too? How do we see home? How do you? Desire changes like rings on a tree. Sometimes different times and states are true at once. Sometimes people don't want to show everything or they can't because they are wrestling it or wondering about it or laughing or sidetracked or blinded. Sometimes there aren't words. When Tiny thinks about all of this, she feels young and old at once and a cluster of white lights in her wrist and chest humming. I'm going to finish up with page 91. Death happens every day. Tiny's mother dies every day. So does Kelly. Every day, Tiny wakes up and thinks, my mother is dead. Kelly is dead. My body is here. Sometimes she sleeps with one hand on her breast. Eventually, Tiny grows sea legs. She thinks about the mermaid who lost her family and her voice for love. How, to be free, you have to give up a part of yourself over and over again. You have to be open to change. Might the mermaid have preferred everyone just came to her in the ocean instead, as they were? Sure. But the center cannot hold. A lot of people think that means get used to disappointment. But it doesn't. It means we have bodies. We're in an ecosystem in time. We're alive, real, and material. The table is never just a table. To insist that it is means ignoring who made it and what happened at it. What happens at it? Its uses, the view from all sides, the animal hiding underneath. Mourning can be an incessant humming in the ears, in the chest. You get used to it, but you never forget it's there. Tiny thinks more about the mermaid who gave up her tail, her sisters, and all the lights she ever knew for love. She agreed to that. Tiny probably wouldn't make that wager, but she'll never have to. Its world doesn't exist for her. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Woo! 
Everyone's clapping and putting hearts in the chat as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I want to mention again, if anyone has questions for any of our artists tonight, they should feel free to put them in the chat and we read them out. But Mairead, I have one for you if you're, if you're up for a question. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously a poetic retelling of Antigone, and I wanted to hear a little bit about what drew you to the story of Antigone in the first place, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Um, Stephanie called it. I had the, it was like a thing that was presented to like angry girls in, a, <laughs> in high school. <laughs> and um, it, it was, it was a lucky then when I went to my PhD program and I had a minute to like really kind of like parse where that came from. Like how Stephanie said, then you had this minute where you're like, oh, this is the script, but the system that exists kind of like puts it in a weird box. And so um it was a story that I felt was important that I always wanted to track. And then when I got to a part of my life where I luckily had time to read the many translations, which like, as we've also said now is important, have many people in your life, have many different translations. Um, I got to track it a little bit. Um, I also liked it too, cause it is so short and also so intense. So it's like, it was a cool experience to like sit with 80 pages and like have your brain melt repeatedly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yes, for sure. That makes complete sense. Um, we have a question for Rose and Pearl about the mice, they, if, if that's okay. Uh, the audience would like to know if you've taught them any tricks. No, but I think we might be able to. Yeah? I don't know. If, like, I wanted to start a mouse circus, but I'm well, too scared to Well, they can't stand on their feet. Hmm. It's not on track. But no, we have not taught them any tricks. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, have, have, has our video been on this whole time? No, okay. I didn't think so, but I wanted to make sure. <laughs> you're, you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no other questions yet. Um, so I don't know if you guys have discussion or questions for one another. I'd be happy to facilitate that. I have a question for Steven. Um, how... Uh... Are you like, are you keeping those moments in like a notebook kind of a thing? Like, is it like a practice you feel you want to be like out in the world at some point? Or is it like, like, how do you think about a physical space for these notes about people? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know yet. Yeah, I've just been like writing them down. And it's funny, like it started on Facebook. Like I would just make these Facebook posts and I was like, I need to keep these, you know, these are nice. <laughs> so, yeah. I would love to hear a bit about how you all know one another. There's just such warmth uh, between you all, and I would love to hear, yeah, how, how you all met. Stephanie and I used to sit on a rooftop a lot. I feel like she was... I was like, girl! Yeah, no, it's pretty much... It's like, there's, like, marks in the front of the book that are, like, just pretty much straight up from, like... Because we were neighbors for a while, and, like, yeah. So it's just... It's, like, the circle is very literal. <laughs> um, and, uh... It's it's also from like other spaces, but um, I, uh, I I appreciate that um, in the space that we were in, we got to like have our like art mix in different ways, and we went to the same MFA program. Um, but and uh, and I know Stephen from being in the same spaces in Denver and his writing, and I love that there's like a warm community here, and um, and that you like are okay when I write you notes about your books late at night, being like, this is so good. <laughs> Um, and uh, <laughs> and Fred, I've known you for a long time too. I think I first met you when I had a broken leg, and you like came down to Pilsen to hang out. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I know I'm like more on that story. Well, I, I mean, it, it was what 2009, and like, um, you know, I I lived. I lived like within like a one mile radius in different places in Pilsen for a long, long time. So like, that's part of why I'm so excited. There's a bookstore there. Um, and it, and like one of like the lovely parts about, um, there have been many bookstores in Pilsen, but I, I really, I love what you all are doing and the messages that you have and how approachable you are to people. So thank you. Um, and it was a thing though, cause Fred was up North and he like came down to Pilsen. I think it was after AWP and, um, we, uh, we hung out at Simone's for a while, I think. Maybe that was the first time. But we've done different events together, and we worked at poetry together. And um, 
because uh, Chicago is a magical place that way. It's <laughs> um, from the little girl I met everybody. I'm so happy <laughs> to be here, though. <laughs> Um, Erica would like to has says tiny shape of grief is so singular. Can you talk a little bit more about how grief takes different outlines and how tiny made this shape? And also says hi, so proud. Um, I think I think um, it's important to walk through it. I think I didn't really understand that you didn't have to sit with your grief or like understand it completely. And um, thinking about like maps where you're like looking at somebody like on the top like the idea that like if you're a snail and you're like going as a snail on the path for the first time it's way harder but if you're like another snail buddy behind the first snail and you can like kind of skate on the slime a little bit it's way easier um so i think i think it can take different kinds of shapes which i think is important because grief is always different um does anybody else have an answer for that i i know that like Stephanie and Stephen, especially like you all, I think I've written about loss in ways that have really stuck in my head. Um, do you have anything, you, any way you would answer that? Like, how does it answer in dance for you, Stephanie? Huh? How does it, how does it fit for you in dance? Oh man, that turns into a whole other thing. <laughs> like sweat stains. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like you said it though. It's the, the idea that a map is not always like a thing that you have to get you where you're going. Like sometimes you're the one writing it or like you're the one beating the trail that will ultimately be written. And so I think that like realizing that there are things that are marks and scars, but that they're not necessarily always going to be like narratively yours I think is like um a relief because I think like the singularity of grief I think is really what can what you can choke on and I think that something that the tiny does so well is sort of give you room to process that like she's carrying exactly as much of it as she can carry that day <laughs> and like that kind of um like the way in which it's like boundless like it's always going to be there but that doesn't mean that you have to be oppressed by like the bigness of it is super helpful I don't know I don't know that yeah I feel like there's just like something in that for me that is really what it means to like carry the ephemeral or like what it means to like because grief is like mad ephemeral you know but it's also super scarring and so it's just like that permanent Invisibility is oof, free stain, girl. <laughs> you did so good. And so it's so such a tiny little it's such a tiny little thing. And it's so I just decided the other day to just read it all the way through, like from top to bottom. And I was like, I'm not gonna leave the studio to live just like and I, I kept being super overwhelmed, so I started like painting these things because I just like didn't know how to process it but I'd already made a commitment to sticking with it and it was like if I made marks between to process then I could like keep processing it so maybe that's also that's also it you know yes so that was my experience too reading it yeah I was like wow I need I, I don't know what to do with myself and yeah <laughs> Yeah, but it felt like what I was thinking about, like grief and loss. Uh, grief and loss too is like this type of emptying that feels like it happens, and then and like something else kind of comes in to fill you up somehow, whatever it is. I don't know. And then like that was kind of my experience reading that book too. Is like being overwhelmed and like feeling like that before. Like wow, like this flood of stuff is coming, but I've also experienced loss in these ways. So yeah, that's wow. Yeah. <laughs> I remember one time at Counterpath, you were like, there's a lot of light in that book. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll put more in. And so it was like an observation <laughs> that you made, like, to shape the whole book in a certain way. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I was happy when I, when I started reading it again. I was like, oh, the light, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's because we talked. I put it in. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Elena in the chat, uh, Marie would like to know your writing process, and I'd love to hear about everyone's artistic process as well, Rose and Pearl too, if you'd like to share. Yeah, I think, like, Elena, Elena knows, like, hi, friend. Um, like, we, uh, when I first, like, really started thinking seriously about writing, it was, like, at a round table with a bunch of people, and we would all read the same text and then talk about it. And um, I was in college, so it was, it was like, a, a great books major. And it was really helpful because not everybody in the room thought the same way. And I think it was the first time that I really had someone say, yes, but you have to read the same thing and then talk about it together. And so, like, we weren't, most of the time, we weren't asked to come to the same conclusion. And, like, I really appreciated being able to do that. And I think that was really cool because it made me realize that a book doesn't have to have a certain kind of structure really ever, which has made me kind of a pain sometimes <laughs> to be in a workshop with or in other places with, but I think also like helps us figure out the stories that we need. Um, and I am lucky that for the different parts of my life where I've really been able to focus on my writing, I've never, I've been in a room with some amazing writers, but it's never just been writers. Like I really think about music a lot. I think about like when you're standing up to say something versus when you're sitting to do something, which makes Zoom reading so weird. Like it's so disorienting to sit down and read from a text, um, but it's also great. Um, and uh, I shoot free throws a lot when I don't know what I'm doing, which is something that I've done with my dad. And so I have this sense where like, if you just like go out and do it, regularly then eventually it will make sense or you'll move on from it in a way that's helpful um so it's part of it and color too as stephanie was obviously noticing <laughs> what what, is, what are the rest of your your artistic processes um so i'm similar to you um because i came to writing late in my life so i did all of these other art things prior to writing. So I like to have other things that's not writing to help me write. Like I'm learning from flower arranging, painting, film, cooking, and all of these things, and shooting free throws. I mean, it was like, yes, I love shooting free throws too, but like, yes, yeah, sports and all of these other things. So like, it's odd, writing is last, but it's the thing that I put out in the world, but it's the last part of the process for me. Pearl, did you have uh, something you wanted to share? Um, well, really when I make art, I feel like I'm not really aiming to make anything. I'm just like putting down really whatever, like just like start doing something and then see, like maybe show the whole page. Like oh, it like, takes forever to think of something to draw. So usually I'll just like take a pen or something and just kind of like just start writing on the page with scribbles mm -hmm. and kind of do nothing and then I oh, keep on starting over because I feel like that I feel like it's not like turning out to be something and then I like go back and color and then it turns out to be like nothing but still something what about your emotion when you do it? Mm, my emotion like in how like when you're angry uh when I'm angry, I'll just stab whatever I'm writing with some skinny <laughs> And then I'll like mess up the marker or something. And then I'll throw it. <laughs> I love that because like I feel that that's so important to do because if you're doing it in your art, then you know how it feels, you know? And then you can know that it like stays in that space. Like, I think that's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, come through process. <laughs> <laughs> Get into it. Practice. Come on now. That's it. <laughs> That's all. I, I mean, I just like, that is my whole deal. Mm -hmm. I'm like an expert at nothing. <laughs> but I really, I just really believe in like figuring out for myself, I mean, I feel like art just does whatever you need it to do for you, yo. But I think that for me, it's like the practice is the part I'm going to spend the most time with. The practice is what will define me. Like the things that I make or the people that like the things that I make or 
whoever commits to that work is is temporary, even with the semi permanent works, let alone the performance works and the and and the ephemeral works, which is ninety nine percent of what I do. Um, so that that for me is everything. It's just like how do I what is a practice that helps me be in the world? Like, how am I going to be here? And that kind of the dissociative thing of like not knowing how to be in one's body at times and being like, okay, well, maybe if I can just like translate through three things, then maybe I can do enough of the cycle to translate back to myself is also just like such a big part of, I can't always stop getting out of me, but I can kind of, keep asking questions till I get back, you know, like as opposed to insisting. And I think that that for me is so much of, of creative pro process. Like for me, medium fidelity has been really hard or, um, and at the same time, I'll, I feel like I work on the same project for six years because for me, a project is not the singular stops along the way that are the things that go out into the world. There is all the journey of of feeling through and experiencing through and and the lucky thing is that I, the only person that gets that is me and that kind of um first audienceness like it's like i had to learn to honor myself a little bit more because i just i honor listening and receiving other people's work too much so that for me is like that practice listening as a goal for translation instead of for like insistence just became such a big and i feel like that generosity I'm just like gonna point at Maraid as like being someone in my life that really came in when I was like in so many kinds of processes and as an interdisciplinary artist who was constantly like, I belonged nowhere because I was in so many spaces and that could feel really lonely. And there was a way in which I was always running into certain people <laughs> in those multitudes that helped me feel like I was part of some kind of road and that it that it was like a safe road to walk because I had sort of some senses that it wasn't as as isolating as I thought it was and like that kind of faith is something that you can only build when you watch other people's processes be so consistent and their practices be so consistent just like their commitments you know and I feel like that's so much of my experience with you I just made this a love fest sorry <laughs> important that when you're working in different medium to like know that there's somebody like at your elbow right here like I feel like I will have this sense forever of walking into Skylark and like someone's at this like one booth or like um you know like thinking about like I would go over to your place and you would like have a bunch going on but your plants would be so happy and you would have something that like smelled really good you know and it's just like how we like keep on keeping things alive in different ways, <laughs> you know, and seeing each other. Um, which makes me think, like, Stephen, you have, like, a movie out right now, right? Isn't it, isn't it like, just... Yeah. You're in it now? Yeah, it came out, like, last Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us, tell us. Wait, what is it? What's the name? What's up? Yeah. Where we see it? Oh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, it came out. <laughs> The, the name of it is The Usual Route, uh, R-O-U-T-E. I don't know, city folks say root, I guess, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, it's on YouTube. Yeah, you can just Google The Usual Route. It is based off my novel, Potted Meat. So, yeah. YouTube, usual, it's a short film, 10 minutes long. So, yeah. We, it, we finished the uh, film festival circuit, so we put it on YouTube. Congratulations. That Thank is a beat. It feels like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have time for two more questions as everyone wants to hang in there. Um, does that sound okay? Good. Um, Jay says, I'm still really stuck on the description of setting, aka light, uh, weather, the wider natural world, and I would, that I was gushing about above. Uh, they were gushing in the chat. <laughs> Um, was the setting clear at the outset, Maraid, or did it enter the writing later in the process? That's a real, that's a good question, and it and again it like connects to like conversations about light and color um, with like all of you, and also it goes back to my mom. Like I grew up in Seattle, and like I was like 
a bummed out teenager as many excellent teenagers are but like my mom was the one who was like you need more light happening like you're in a you're in a place with a bunch of clouds like this is this thing and she must have said it to me like hundreds of times and then finally I was like oh um (laughs) and so I think I think like that's what answer like thinking about how light works in different ways and then thinking about like what I love about film and and like knowing so many people to like think about light really concretely like Stephanie like your red and blue light and your plants and like how we're all like in zoom right now like I have like all my fluorescence in my place on right now and like it matters so much because you see how different shadows work and you see yourself better um being in church with my mom when I was a kid and like watching like the stained glass crawl across the carpet um I think that connects to time because that's your sense of time happening. Um, and uh, being around water, like I've talked about water with you all too, like that's like a, also a sense of time and also like a sense of your body. Like when I came to Colorado, I felt kind of lopsided because there was no like river to the river anywhere. And then there was like no like giant like Lake Michigan, um, but then it was okay. Then you keep moving through it and you find water elsewhere. So I think, yeah, I think that is where it started. Then our last question for the evening, maybe for Rose and Pearl as well, um, but maybe you can answer, Fred. Uh, they want to know if Hero the Mouse is named after Mairead's cat, or if vice versa, or if it's just a happy coincidence and all animals are heroes. Um, well, I, I actually picked out Hero's name because I just thought that was kind of like a fun name, and... I don't know why hero, the mouse reminded me of a hero. I'll tell him. You know, it, it may, might be good to note that hero uh, has lost every fight because uh, he had uh, two or three brothers who two, three brothers. They brutalized him. It was it was horrible scene. So much fighting, bloodshed. You know, um, nicks and tails. The boys, the the males. They, they beat up the girl? No. Yes. And we, we always kicked out the most violent mouse. And the hero uh, was the one who survived because he was uh, the most peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was the youngest, too. What is he? They're all like the same age. No. Wow. Well, they're small. Just about. Yeah. <laughs> hero was the youngest. Sometimes the youngest ones are the most powerful. Yeah, because they have power of the parents. <laughs> I have power. You do have power. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone for joining us here tonight. Does anyone have any last words before we close out? Can you tell us about the bookstore, Mandy? Like, how can we support the bookstore from afar? Wow, so many people have already ordered Tiny from the bookstore, which is so great. We had to order another stack. Um, we're, it's been there since 2016, and this year in March, we transformed to a worker cooperative um, right before the pandemic, and it's been a wonderful uh, experiment that we are uh, living through day by day. So you can always check out our website, pillscommunitybooks.com, or our social media, but really, we were just so honored that uh, you wanted to host your launch with us tonight, Raid. We're huge fans, so thanks for thinking of us. And thank you, Stephen and Stephanie and Rose and Pearl and Fred. This is this is really great. An evening of joy. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> this is so awesome. Thank you so much. And it's so it's so nice to meet you, Stephen. Yes. Yes. Nice.